It's the lens, it's the lens, it's the lens, gotta live diverse. It's the lens, it's the lens, it's the lens, to live diverse. You are listening to The Lens Living Diverse, a podcast brought to you by the CNIB Advocacy Team. Join Nisha, Vivi, and I as we speak to individuals with intersecting identities who live with sight loss as they share their unique stories. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Lens Living Diverse. I am your host for today. I am flying solo, which is nothing wrong with that. I I enjoy it, but I do miss Nisha and Vivi for sure. But yeah, we're going to do this episode and we're going to have a wonderful episode for you. So uh, today I have a special guest and we're going to have a discussion about how uh, sight loss has evolved for him, especially coming from the Muslim culture. So I have my uh, friend, I have met him through uh, the Vision Network, which we will talk about further in the episode. So I just want to introduce everybody to my good friend, Azar Kareen. Hello, Azar. How are you doing today? Hi, Ben. How are you? Thanks for uh, inviting me to your show. It's uh, I'm, I'm excited to be on your podcast. Of course. And this is almost three years in the making. I would say three or two years in the making. I always wanted you to come on here and tell your story. Yeah, around that time, yes. Yeah, of course. So speaking of telling your story, if you could let the listeners know a little bit about yourself and your uh, different identities that you hold. Yeah, so I'm a brown male with totally white hair. <laughs> um, and I originally come from uh, Pakistan. That's where I was born and raised. I had uh, all my education over there and started my working career there. And then I moved to different places. We'll talk about that later. Um, another identity that I hold is I'm legally blind and partially sighted. I live with an eye condition, which is known as Stargardt's. Um, it's a genetic uh, a disease which happens at early age, and uh, that's what happened with me. I, I was hit by it at the age of seven. Uh, it can happen at a later age as well, like some people get it like after 20s or 30s. But usually it happens at an early age. And um, that's why it is also known as juvenile macular degeneration. So that's how I started my early age with this mm. disability. And um, But I was kind of lucky in the sense that in the early stages, it wasn't so bad and uh, I could still read and write so mm. I could you know go to school and complete my education. Thank you for sharing as I appreciate that and uh, yeah we were speaking to uh, with each other prior and I even definitely being a part of the Dean Vision Network as well for myself and uh, attending the groups early on we learned a lot about each other and uh, you have been in different different countries, so you know the different experience of how countries take to sight loss. So uh, if you could share with the listeners the different countries you've been to and the different experiences with sight loss within those countries. Okay, so as I said, I, I was uh, raised in Pakistan, but then I had an opportunity to uh, work in Saudi Arabia. But even before that, I went to actually, my first uh, experience out of Pakistan was going to uh, UK, going to Scotland for mm -hmm. my higher education. You know, I completed my master's in, in Pakistan, but then I got an opportunity to go for another degree. So that was my first exposure out of Pakistan. And then I mm. spent quite a few years in uh, Saudi Arabia and then finally in, in Canada. So, yeah, so all these places were very different. And I'm talking about when uh, a time period, 
which is many, many years ago. I mean, in Pakistan, when I uh, started experiencing vision loss, it was early 60s. Mm. And you can imagine in that part of the world, you know, what would be the level of awareness uh, in terms of uh, disabilities. I mean, these things that we talk about these days, uh, inclusion and accessibility and, you know, removing barriers, these these things were totally unknown mm. at that time in, in, that, in that culture and that society. Things have changed a lot. We'll talk about that. But when, when I was experiencing all, all of this, it was in that kind of environment. And um, and for a very long time, the level of awareness and the resources and uh, you know support services were were absolutely non-existent. So that's how I spent my early years and mm. all my education and you know in schools and colleges and universities, we did not have these accessibility counselors and you know special departments mm. and and uh, nobody was there to uh, tell you how to you know things like alternative living skills and orientation and mobility and I mean these things were unheard of. So that's how I I grew up, and I've seen things, you know, evolving in front of my eyes. Yeah. But um, when I went to to Scotland, things were very different because obviously it was a much more developed world. Um, but because of my background from Pakistan, I was unable to really benefit from from the support system which was avail- available there. Mm. So that was my unawareness about, you know, how different that society was. So my tendency was to hide my disability. Because mm. I thought maybe over there, somehow this would be taken as a, as a negative. Uh, and at a very, I was there for, for one year. And at a very later stage, I found out that this place is totally different. They have, you know, they pay a lot of uh, attention to these things and there's disability mm. support and, and, and I missed all of that. So that's the difference of, you know, societies and cultures. Since I had yeah. my background from Pakistan, so I, I really could not imagine that how disability was treated over there. A question about uh, the two different experiences in Scotland and Pakistan you were making mention that you were used to hiding your disability when you went to Scotland. Did you feel that you had to hide your disability in Pakistan as well? No, I I was not hiding my disability in in Pakistan because you know, I I grew up with it, you know, and uh, mm. from an early age, and um, I was I was very lucky in the sense that the school that I was going to, although they didn't have any awareness as it's, as I said about uh, disability and stuff. But my teachers and my classmates are, were very supportive. I mean, I never had issues like isolation and bullying and stuff like that. And probably one reason was that I was a good student. So I, you know, enjoyed some kind of respect as well yeah. among my classmates. So I was you know, I had to withdraw from certain things, like I could not play outdoor games like cricket and football. But then I moved to some alternate, you know, options. So I used to play different indoor games. And I used to participate in all uh, school activities. So, so, so that never was an issue for me, which is kind of strange, because when I hear stories of different people, even in Canada, yeah. They have some bad stories of their time in school and all that. But I was extremely, and I, that's why I have a lot of respect for my teachers who accommodated me, my classmates. I mean, you can imagine one of my classmates used to sit next to me. And yeah. for many years, he used to dictate everything from the blackboard because I could not see anything on the blackboard. So that's how I used to take my notes. So that was a very supportive environment. And later when I went to school, uh, sorry, college and university, I even used to go and tell my teachers 
that mm. I have this disability and so that they could accommodate me as much as possible. And again, my experience was not bad. I, I did get that support, although it wasn't something like a formal uh, arrangement and I'm, I was not getting extra time for um, tests or I was not getting large print or anything but yeah. as much as was available they were providing me and that was something you know commendable and I, I think I was I was very lucky on that end so um, and then um, getting going back to my experience in Scotland but over there I thought uh maybe I, I have to hide my uh, disability because it may go against me and things like that. Mm. So I, I missed on so many things. So that was, you know, one difference uh, that I could mention. And then I, when I moved to Saudi Arabia, that was in a totally different setup because then I was working for a major corporation like the national um, carrier, the, the national airline of Saudi Arabia. And I was hired through a very rigorous process. And, um, and they initially did not know of my, the extent of my disability. They mm. gradually uh, discovered. But again, um, based on my performance as, a, as an employee, um, they did not make it uh, an issue as long as I was able to deliver. And that part went very well. But interacting with the society in general, I noticed that there was very little awareness again. But then I saw things changing. I spent a lot of years over there. For example, uh, if I talk about traveling experience, there was no support available for people with disabilities at airports mm. and you know airline staff was not knowledgeable and uh, when i compare it with this part of the world it was a huge difference you know the way we get support at airports and all that so those things were totally missing what time frame was this was this like the 70s 80s or um when i went to scotland in 84 and i was in saudi arabia in 1990 so 90s and 2000s i spent over there and um so in the later uh, uh, days of my stay i noticed the changes the airline became mm. more and more aware they established a department for special needs. You know, that's what they call it, special needs, uh, you know, services. They set up a counter at the airport. You know, staff was more knowledgeable. Um, on board, during the flight, they had special, you know, because they have to meet international uh, standards. So they had special, you know, arrangements, how they treat people with disabilities and people with vision loss. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw those things evolving in my in front of my eyes. Uh, going to, you know, Saudi Arabia is also a religious center for Muslims. Yes. So going to the holy places, again, in early years, it wasn't that good. But then later, mm -hmm. Saudi government has invested a lot in improving, you know, those two holy mosques. So we could see ramps for wheelchairs and, and other things. But but the society, the people in general were not very well aware. But there was, mm. you know, at the institutional level, you could see that things were changing. And now what I hear, things have changed significantly over there. There's much more, you know, awareness. When I moved from Saudi Arabia to Canada, you know, it was a it was a huge difference. You know, Canada was um, there were so many new things for me. Even if I talk about CNIB having an organization like this, I mean, this was unimaginable in in that part of the world. Thank you for sharing, Azar. And it's so much to unpack from uh, what you and Mickey mentioned. First of all, I am so happy to hear the support that you had back home when it came to uh, your disability and your stargards. And that's that's a really, really good thing to hear, like really uh, honorable to hear that 
you you grew up with that support and I'm, I'm glad to hear that and then also uh to make mention i i love hearing about when you were working at the airport because you saw accessibility involved and then even look at the the wording it used to be called special needs as you were making mention and now it's called accessibility yeah so so it's really cool to to hear your experiences in the airport and going to Scotland and uh, just traveling through the world. You're you're a very adventurous, well traveled person. Yeah, I traveled to many places because my the nature of my work was that I used to work for the training department and I used to travel to different you know locations to train uh, local staff over there, um, mainly in the area of aviation management and marketing and sales and customer service. So that gave me an opportunity to travel to different parts of the world. And that was a wonderful and very rewarding experience in, in general. And also how I cope with all of that with my disability, you know, during travel and, you know, uh, you know, handling things at the airport and how do I get support, you know, because asking for support is also very important. Letting people know that where do you need uh, help at the airport. And then, you know, I used to arrange training sessions at different hotels or locations and preparing that location with my disability because you know we didn't have powerpoints and stuff mm. at that time we used like overhead projectors so how would i i could not see if i put a slide on an, or a transparency on the overhead projector i could not see the image on the screen so how do I go about? So I had to be creative and I found my ways that how would I, so I used to, you know, write in, you know, very large um, fonts uh, with, with markers and keep uh, pages in front of me. So whichever transparency was on the projector, the same page was in front. So I never looked at the screen mm -hmm. and still I could, you know, deliver my talk. So I'm, I'm just mentioning that how you know creative I had to be in terms of dealing with my my disability, and then getting different kind of responses. If I'm running a course in the Middle East, it was a different experience compared to running a course say in in London, or in Colombo or in Karachi, because you were talking to different audience. You know, mm -hmm. people coming from different uh, ethnic groups and cultures. So so all of that was was an very uh, interesting and very rewarding experience. I like the word you use creativity and that kind of goes hand in hand with adaptabilities. So as I made mention, well traveled, a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge and with that said, uh you brought that to Dean Vision Network and that's actually how me and yourself met. Uh I would say three years ago when I believe around the pandemic and that's when, yeah. yeah, I joined the group and I had the honor and privilege of meeting you. And with that said, I would love for you to tell the listeners about your involvement with uh, Dean Vision Network and what it is. Okay. So before I answer your question, I'll, I'll step back a little bit. So when I, came to Canada, I came at, a, at an age where, you know, I was not pursuing um, an active career. My desire was to give something back to the society because my feeling was that throughout my life, many people and organizations gave me a lot of good support, as I just mentioned. And now it was time for me to give back to the society. And that's how I started in Canada. So I started looking for volunteering opportunities. And I immediately joined CNIB as a volunteer and you know tried to do whatever work I could, but since I had a part-time job, so I couldn't do much. So at the same time, I tried to upgrade my skills. So I went into this um, uh, web and digital, you know, 
accessibility and I self-train myself and I, I from time to time I do web testing and stuff like that. And as part of my volunteering and advocacy work, I now sit on um, to municipal committees. Mm. I am a member of Region of Peel Accessibility Advisory Committee. It's my second term over there. And I'm also sitting on Trans Help Advisory Committee. Mm. Again, my second term and I'm vice chair. The reason I'm mentioning this that with the same uh, desire, I joined Teen Support Services because I found out there is an organization established by Muslims and they work for uh, people with disabilities. So <clears throat> the Envision Network actually is part of a parent organization called Teen Support Services and Dean stands for Disability Empowerment Equality Network. So we mainly provide support services to persons with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities. And under that, one of the initiatives is the Envision Network. So when I joined Dean as a volunteer, that was the first thing I was asked to do, to set up a peer support group for people who are blind or partially sighted so that they can meet virtually, you know, every month or, you know, twice a month, and they can support each other through their um, lived experiences, mm -hmm. their skills and knowledges. So that's how back in 2016, we launched the Envision Network. So I was the one who launched it with the support of my colleagues. It was a very small group initially, we used to do one phone call, conference call every month. And it was mainly for GTA. And then later uh, it expanded. So we then, you know, invited people from other parts of Canada. They could join us. Um, and then we went international. So we have some members from um, countries, you know, other than Canada. So the significant thing about the InVision Network is that it is predominantly a group created by Muslims, but we are not bringing together only blind and partially sighted Muslims, but you know, Muslims are living all over the world. So we are bringing together a very diverse group of people who come with different ethnic backgrounds and cultures. So we have people from Africa, we have people from Middle Eastern background, we have people from Southeast Asia, um, people like yourself who come mm -hmm. from, you know, from a different faith and from a different, um, you know, ethnic identity. So this is a very significant feature of our group that we have such a variety of diverse et uh, ethnic groups in, in this network. And they come with a very rich, you know, um, experience of their own, uh, their their disability experience and how disability was treated in, in their own uh, cultures. They, they speak different languages, you know, they they belong to um, different um, different cultures. They and they are they are uh, coming with different um, qualifications and and skills. Some of our members are highly professional. <clears throat> they are bankers, and you know they they are very successful. So, in that sense, this uh, network brings together a very you know rich. Uh, resource of uh, knowledge and experience which we all share and um, the, the the group is expanding and, um, and one of the things that I, I would like to mention that we uh, spend a lot of time on vision tech training and, mm -hmm. and you've been involved in that you were one of our trainers yeah. and that's that's a big support we are providing so this training can be a group setting or it could be one to one as well if one of the group members needs any help with any vision technology related things like computers or mobile devices we provide that support and so we hold sessions for group training sessions and also 
one-to-one -one sessions. So this is how it is going on. And um, I encourage more and more people to join the group, not just from the Muslim community, but from any, any uh, ethnic group. Agreed, agreed. And I, I got to say, even joining Dean Vision Network, I met some great people. As Azar was saying, I met some amazing people. And it even helped me learn more about the Muslim faith. And the beautiful thing about it is, even though I have a different faith, I was welcome. And I still call you, you folks, my family, my Dean Vision family. And I remember... Uh, when we met up in Brantford, the first thing I said, oh, my family's here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So it it's such a, it was such a, or it is an enjoyable experience. And I, I have friends, I still connect, although I haven't been to, to meetings lately, I still connect with everybody. And it was just such a great experience to network. And it was even one point where one of the members, I remember a story where I was looking at the group and one of the members put on the group uh, audition for a show, the show C. And I remember finding out from the Dean Vision Support Network uh, group. Mm -hmm. So it, it's filled with great information. Everybody's always there to help answer questions. And it, it's a great community built for sure. Thank you, Ben, and I, I really value your uh, participation in the in the group. And you have been a very important member, and you still are. And um, I I really uh, admire the the role that you play. And uh, thanks for the good words that you just said. Of course, thank you, thank you, Azar. I appreciate that. I'm wondering, with disability and the Muslim faith, if you could share with us your experience of being a Muslim male living with sight loss? Yeah, so um, I would say, uh, again, the, the uh, main issue is the lack of awareness in, in different uh, societies. So my experience as, as a Muslim in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned, was was different because the general level of awareness about disabilities was was low. But here in in Canada, things are different because when I go to a mosque, um, I find that it is much more accessible compared to a mosque mm. back home. Because over here we have uh, some, you know, legal requirements uh, according to the building codes and and our AODA, you know, uh, standards. So um, our mosques are more accessible. But I um, mean, there is more to be to be done here. I mean, we we see like ramps and stuff like that. But uh, maybe we can do more even even here especially making um, other things more accessible in terms of signage and, you know, uh, if we distribute any material, you know, some flyers, do we, do we take care to provide them in, in alternate uh, format and stuff like that? So those, those changes have to be done. So um, there's more and more awareness needed. But I want to mention something, something different that in uh, our religion, there are some great stories that we hear uh, at the time of our prophet. Mm. And when those stories are narrated to us, that how in that society, um, people were, with disabilities were treated. And that is quite amazing that even at that time in, in our uh, Muslim society, people with disabilities were given a lot of respect. Our mm -hmm. prophet, you know, gave um, uh, like uh, guidelines that how we treat people with disabilities, what role they would have in society. And one of like uh, one of the blind companions of the prophet was given very important roles. He was appointed as a governor of a province, imagine 1400 years ago. So, so that kind of awareness when we spread among our Muslim community, and it can be a lesson for, for any faith, 
that tells us that what is the the importance of uh, this segment of population in in any society and how they should be treated so what we do as an organization every year on 3rd of december which is the um in uh, day for persons with disabilities the idpd yes um the the friday before or after 3rd of december we ask uh, the imams of our mosques to dedicate their friday sermon to this topic of disability mm. and they then they narrate these kind of uh, stories and the guidelines which are available in in islam and now we don't do it just in canada we do it around the world mm. because we have a network so all around the world wherever we can reach imams on that particular day will talk about the subject of disability and how um it should be uh, treated and what are the guidelines in in islam so this is something great that our organization is is uh, working on so but there is lot to be learned because then <clears throat> again in islamic uh, culture we have some other beliefs like you know we are um, allowed to marry our cousins or close relatives now when it comes to genetic you know disabilities that are communicated genetically there is an issue and we we recommend that people should not marry their close relatives and mm-hmm. there there's you know sometimes these beliefs uh, come in the way so that's why more and more awareness is needed but one last thing that i want to say um in answer to your question that um now our holy book the quran is available in braille Nice. and there are many people who read quran with braille there are braille reciters which is which is a great thing and i would like to see more and more literature available in accessible format because mm. you know other books religious books and other you know translations and all that i i don't know how much is that available but we need to do a lot of work to make um, that material you know uh, available in different accessible formats so mm, that is what i would you know like to say about uh, my experience in the muslim community and to hear that that's very comforting to know that you're able to access the quran in braille because i know we were speaking prior and the one thing i noticed when we look at diversity or we look at religion or we look at race or just any other kind of diverse aspect or identity is sometimes the gaps there's little gaps that people don't address that need to be filled in so example uh you could be a muslim and going to the mosque but then when they don't have the quran available in braille or even audio a version or like a audiobook version that leaves people out yeah. where they can't celebrate the religion and uh, that's why i think it's so important just like you're saying to have that awareness and to speak about these little gaps that people don't realize uh i know i'm putting you on the spot but is there any other little gaps that you would like to see addressed or little gaps to bring to the attention of the audience as well with accessibility i i would say um again you know we we need to pay more attention in to understanding the needs of uh, people with disabilities when they go to mosques and islamic schools and centers so there has to be a better understanding of our needs not just for the blind but for all all kinds of uh, disabilities and uh, some places we see those gaps uh, that uh, attention is not paid to the details like uh, for a wheelchair user do they have proper access to to washrooms or the main you know prayer area or do we remove all kind of you know barriers uh, uh, which make 
cause some difficulty. For example, in mosques, you know, people um, take off their shoes and they would pile up shoes in front of the door and a blind person can very easily, you know, trip on that. Mm. So, so these are some small details that um, the, the administrators of these places, they need to understand that this could be a barrier and we need to address that. And as I said, <clears throat> when um, um, things like providing ASL support and, you know, when they have special um, events or um, sermons or things like that or other activities, they could pay attention to that, um, making uh, your audio video material accessible people who are hard of hearing so there are there are so many things that can be can be done to further improve things for uh, people with disabilities yes and that's why i'm so excited for the dean support network as well as the dean vision network because you folks are the ones that are, are bringing the awareness and you folks are the ones that are changing accessibility when it comes to aspects such as that. Yeah, and we we are very proud of uh, our work because we took a lead on that. And uh, uh, in all our activities, whether at our center or in our events or different programs, we make it a point that uh, we, we spread this awareness and we make, uh, you know, um the the islamic uh, places um and the whole canada you know barrier free why not uh, uh it should be made uh, barrier free for everybody so not just for the muslim community exactly big key to uh disability justice so i'm going to go back to the fact that like i said you're a well traveled individual you may mention you saw sight loss or the evolution of uh, support with sight loss from the 60s and growing up and seeing it today. So something that's very important to us with sight loss is technology. And I remember speaking to you during the Dean Vision Network or even just speaking to you in general. And I I was so surprised where I was like, wow, this guy knows his technology and you're telling me about the iPhone and you're telling me and you're always willing to learn something new. Uh, if you could share with the audience your journey with technology and how it helped you as well as other factors to your evolution of technology. Yeah, so I'm glad you asked about it because that's my favorite topic <laughs> and my... <laughs> My journey is 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 really it's it's a long long journey because um, when I started losing vision, there was no technology at all. All we had was a magnifying glass. That too in a very crude form, not like the modern um, video <laughs> magnifiers. Mm -hmm. So so I saw everything um, as I said before um, e evolving in front of me. And luckily, very luckily, I was a technology-friendly person. Even as a kid, you know, I loved to play with these gadgets and, you know, these things used to fascinate me. Um, I, I used to, you know, build uh, small, small radios, you know, like in a matchbox or something. Mm. I mean, th that's how, you know, I was um, technology-friendly. So, and that's the best thing that happened to me uh, with regards to dealing with my disability. So I became computer literate at a very, very early stage. I mean, uh, when I went to Scotland in 84, that was the first time I saw home computers. And, um, and, and that technology really, um, you know, attracted me and I started learning that. Now, at that stage, it was not a disability support, but later on, it became a major tool, you know, as long as everything was DOS-based with, you know, those old, I don't know if you ever seen those, uh, you know, monitors with mm. green and black screens. Yep, I remember and, IBMs, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so, um, I mean, at that time, my vision was, you know, good enough to to 
cope with that. But later on, when Windows and other things were introduced and we had the option to change the font size, and then it really became uh, an accessibility thing. And that's how I, I started. So I started with early word processors. Um, there was a program I want to mention. It was uh, something like PowerPoint. It was called Harvard Graphics. And that was amazing. You know, we could make uh, transparencies and slides with that. And I could, you know, put fonts of different sizes. So that became a tool for me to deal with my, you know, disability. And then I got very <clears throat> creative and I started exploring the accessibility features of Windows. And I found out that there was a magnifier, there was an option to change the theme and you know change the font sizes and everything. So I used to create my own theme for for my computer, which would you know make things bigger for me and you know with with large uh, windows and everything. So so that's how I started using computer as a support for my disability. Mm. And and I was not a screen reader user because I, I could still, you know, do things visually. And I was not using any magnification software like um, Zoom text uh, stuff. Uh, they were there, but I was relying mostly on the Windows built-in technology features. And I was relying, and, and even today I use the magnifier, which is available within Windows. And then came the, the big change when these uh, mobile devices and smartphones were introduced. Mm -hmm. And my experience with, and I had a very early, I'm, a, an, I'm an early adopter of uh, iPhone. I started using it 2011. And that's where I was introduced with VoiceOver. And I had the very old um, iPhone 3GS model. And that opened up a whole new world for me that what were the possibilities with this technology. So then I immediately got an iPad and, you know, I started training myself and I came to a level where I wanted to, you know, train other people. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what I, what I did when I came to Canada. I started using iPhone when I was in Saudi Arabia and many people didn't know about these features. Even in, in this part of the world, there wasn't, too much awareness at that time. But then things changed rapidly and you know more and more people started using that. And I thought it was uh, an excellent idea to spread the word and let people know that what can they achieve through this technology. Mm. And the Envision Network became one, you know, a forum where we, we offered that. I did it in personal capacity as well. But mainly through uh, the Invasion Network, we started, you know, providing this uh, training, and um, I still do it. And um, I also, as I said, got involved in web uh, and digital accessibility. So I do um, website testing, user wow. testing, accessibility testing, and stuff like that. So that's that's my you know involvement in technology, and I believe I'm strong believer that uh, technology has totally changed the world for people with disabilities, and particularly for people with uh, vision loss. And and you are a witness of that because you yourself you are a great you know user of technology. <laughs> I 100% agree with you as well when it comes to technology and. I was the same as you as well. I remember when I was younger, I would play along or play with the different features of a computer, whether it's like Microsoft Word or Excel or even just the magnification apps on the computer. So I was always so intrigued about technology similar to you. And it has helped us immensely as people with disabilities and even seeing it evolve from my lifetime. So uh, very, very great points that you're break, bringing up. And then also to offer technology to all because technology should be 
given to all ex or inclusive to all. Uh, if you, I know you speak a lot of different languages and uh, when we are training in technology, sometimes language can be a barrier, especially people coming from different countries to Canada. So if you could share with us your experience about um, technology and language and even culture as well. Yeah, sure. Um, you, you've raised a very good point. And this is one thing that we are doing through our um, vision network, that we have the option to offer this uh, vision technology training in, in different languages. And it's not just the language, it's also the comfort level when people interact with, you know, people from the same ethnic or cultural background. So I speak few languages and then in our, uh, in our uh, group, there are other people who are also, I would say, technology experts and they may be speaking some other languages as well. So this is this is a great uh, service that that we can provide. I know CNIB is doing a wonderful job in terms of offering these trainings, and they are now available online. But we are adding <clears throat> another layer that we can do it in in different languages, and that removes a lot of you know cultural and and other barriers. And um, I have trained few people and also you know technology there is a level of uh, inhibition some you know some reluctance especially for our elderly folks mm -hmm. so if you can um, provide them training and bring them to a comfort level uh, speaking to them in their own language and stuff so that makes it easier for them because for elderly people um, it's it's an added challenge to, to adopt technology at that age. So I have some experience of training people in, in the like senior citizens and stuff. So yeah, that that's something uh, very important that technology should be made available for all and people with different backgrounds can equally benefit from, from this uh, wonderful you know option for all kinds of disabilities. I agree. And I find that sometimes it's not even language and sometimes it's even cultural, cultural as well, where I remember teaching someone about technology and they were also an African person. And even mm -hmm. the terminology, sometimes if the terminology could be mixed up, so they could be like, oh, I press the up button. And mm -hmm. Canadian culture, it'd be like the up button. Do you mean the arrow, up arrow key button, right? Yeah. But even just me knowing that culture, like I understand, yeah, I understand the up button or uh, the different terminology. So I feel like it's so key to have that um, cultural understanding as well as that language piece for sure. Yeah, you rightly pointed out. Yeah, the lingo matters a lot. So, you know, when we are using some technology, we tend to use a typical language of that technology. But if we can adapt it to different cultures and the understanding level, then it, it becomes much more effective. Before I move on to the next question, are you still teaching technology to others? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've recently trained, as I said, uh, an, an elderly lady, and I'm, I'm amazed uh, she was so willing to learn. And uh, in few weeks, like in four to six weeks, she was able to use iPhone uh, with you know a lot of comfort. She she has to go a long way, but at least she is now independent. She can make her own phone calls. She can use WhatsApp. She can go to YouTube, and we achieved it uh, within a few weeks. And um, I I do individual one to one training, and um, yeah, I'm, and we are open. I mean, we welcome. Um, um, any such opportunity. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And definitely if I need any uh, technology, new technology advice, I know I just got a new iPhone. So <laughs> I'd definitely be knocking at your door for sure. You're being too modest. You're an expert <laughs> yourself. <laughs> we exchange information. We exchange uh, the different tips and tricks. Uh, so 
Uh, we are starting to run out of time, but before we do, I'd love to ask you if you want to share any last comments or any advice to people who share that similar intersectionality as yourself. It's a couple of things. I mean, uh, on the whole, you know, I mean, my my life story of uh, disability and my whole career, I say that it's a proof and that applies everywhere, that if you provide the right environment, resources, and support, then people of, with disabilities can achieve a lot. And this is what, what I have experienced in my life. And there are many other people, people like yourself, and many other successful people who have major disability, but when they are given the right opportunity, and they are offered the right environment, they can excel. And uh, this applies everywhere, no matter what kind of disability you may have. So that's one point I want to stress. Number two, um, uh, people who experience uh, acquired disability, I mean, there are some people who are blind by birth, but then people may acquire a disability at a later age. I would advise that it's better not to stay in a state of denial and start getting help at a much early stage. Mm. And we should make an effort to go out and find out what support is available. I mean, once we are told that there is a, there's no medical solution, then we should look for all kinds of uh, rehab and support uh, services. And I think CNIB is, is doing a wonderful uh, job in this direction. But lately, you know, um, the approach they have taken in terms of reaching out to diverse communities is a wonderful initiative. And I mm. think you you are an active uh, part of that. So, because when people come to Canada, the, the immigrant population, and they come with different, you know, ethnic backgrounds and also cultural beliefs about disability, then they miss out so many things. So I would advise that people should look out and find out what kind of support system is there, and they must take advantage of that. Mm. So this is this is very critical, and um, CNIB can play an important role. From a cultural and ethnic uh, point of view, I would say that we have to um, we have to revisit some of our beliefs and attitudes regarding disability and realign our thinking with the realities of the modern world. Mm. Because we hold many stereotype of, you know, beliefs in, in all cultures, I would say, um, from not just the Muslim culture, but all kinds of uh, backgrounds from different parts of the world. They have in their societies some kind of um, strange beliefs about people with disabilities, mm. that they should be put aside and they cannot, you know, participate in the society and, and things like that. Those beliefs need to be addressed and they need to be changed so that people of disabilities, this segment of population becomes an important and integral part of the society. And they can also live a life of independence and dignity and make a contribution mm -hmm. towards the society. And lastly, going back to technology, please adopt technology as much mm -hmm. as possible mm -hmm. because technology provides huge opportunities now for all kinds of disabilities. And um, there is, as I said before, there is usually uh, a reluctance. There is some inhibition you know, people get intimidated by technology. Those, you know, uh, fears should be removed and we should always uh, look at the technology options available. 
Wonderful. Great pieces of advice. And uh, thank you so much for coming to today's episode and sitting down and chatting with me, Azar. And I applaud you for your willingness to learn. I applaud you for your leadership. I applaud you for your knowledge and your adaptability. Thank you so much, Ben. It was uh, a pleasure to be on your podcast and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. So uh, once again, thank you to Azar. Uh, for those listening today, if you want to hear other episodes and actually today's episode, you could use your regular streaming platforms such as Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, SoundCloud, and even YouTube. And lastly, if you have any feedback or you want to be a part of the Lens Living Diverse, you could email us at advocacy at cnib.ca. Once again, advocacy at cnib.ca. So once again, listeners, thank you for listening to The Lens. It's always a pleasure. And I hope everybody has a fantastic day. Peace. Peace.